And now welcome to the last talk of the day. And it's very close to night and it's time to tell spooky campfire stories, except this one is 100% real, spooky as it is. It is a talk on shadow profiling and on how Facebook tracks you even if you don't have a Facebook account. So let's give a warm round of applause to Christopher and Frederike and invite them on stage. And Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, it's amazing to be at Congress. This is my first Congress. So, uh, yeah, it's just been an absolute, like, dream. <laughs> I really enjoyed it. Um, and it's, it wouldn't be possible without, like, the, uh, the angels and the, the translators and the heralds. So can we give them a bit of a round of applause? Thank you. Just by a little show of hands, how many people in here are Android developers? Just there's like five of them. Cool. <laughs> and how many of you have used the Facebook SDK in your work? Any of you? Yeah, a couple. Cool. So I'm going to hand over to Frederica, who's <laughs> going to take us for our first couple of slides. Earlier this year, we have filed complaints against seven companies. Those are data brokers, ad tech companies, and companies that do credit scoring. And the reason for our complaints and the reason why we focused on these companies that are really not household name to, names to most people is that it is currently impossible for most people to understand how they're being tracked and profiled and in whose hands all of this data ends up. As part of this research, I asked one of these tracking companies a company called Quantest, that many of you probably haven't heard of, but that has certainly heard of you, <laughs> for all of my data. So what you see here, this is a heavily edited and deliberately blurred version of my browsing history. So what you see here are, those are the websites I've opened, timestamps, device information. Um, this is work-related, so it's quite sensitive sometimes. It also includes inferred data, uh, a predicted value for my gender, whether I have children, my income. And with all of this came partner data from all, other, all kinds of companies, different data brokers, who placed me into infuriating categories like heavy alcohol spender at home or affinity for baby products and nappies. Here's what's so very fascinating about that data, except that it's a lot of data. Some of it is heavily personal, and some of it is very wrong. But what's so fascinating is that all of this data is from one cookie, from one browser, that was placed on one of my devices. This is why today we have just published, right now, um, research about how a very different tracking company tracks people on apps that are built for, for Android. And we've sp focused especially uh, on how Facebook tracks people who do not have a Facebook account. Earlier this year, research by the University of Oxford showed that 42% of apps, of free apps in the Google Play Store in the US and the UK, should, could share data with Facebook. And what's interesting is that this makes Facebook the second largest tracker after Google's parent company, Alphabet. With this research that we just published, we wanted to build on this and show what exactly this data sharing looks like, particularly for people who don't have a Facebook account. The reason we focused on Facebook and not Google or any of the other tracking companies is because the very fact that apps like a period tracker or an LED flashlight shares data with Facebook in the first place will come as a surprise for many people, and especially for those who have made a conscious decision not to be on Facebook. So Here's what we did. <laughs> so we took uh, Oxford University's research from their computer science department. They gave us a copy of their list, and they gave us a list of all of the apps, of the top 5,000 apps that use Facebook SDK. We chose the number of the lar or some of the largest ones, and we also chose a few apps that were uh, that were had sensitive data, like they were either to do with religion, or they were to do with health, or some of the other stuff. A few utility apps out of that selection, um, because utility apps may also have information about other apps. So this is the 34 that we chose. And as you can see, it's a real mix of uh, both big 
big name applications, you know, like Spotify, uh, Indeed, and then much smaller applications that are made by more indie developers, either just games that they make, that sort of thing. And uh, but all of these apps have over 10 million installs, and we we chose apps that had decent install bases because we this isn't this isn't really about the apps themselves and developers. We're not critici- We're not here to criticize developers for. Um, the way they make their apps. This is all about the SDK and the way it transmits data with or without user consent. So I can take you quickly through our analysis methodology. At a, Android, uh, a Nexus 5 running Android 8.1, connected through a virtual machine uh, running MITM proxy, which is a man-in-the-middle proxying tool. Um, and I did it transparently, so the app didn't know that it was being intercepted, and we had a look at what the data was that was going between the app and Facebook. So our first finding was that over 61% of the apps we tested automatically transfer data before the user has any other, like they literally just open the app. So that's 21 out of 34. So for example, here's Kayak. And uh, as you'll see, pretty much immediately from when the app is clicked, it, that first request is straight to graph.facebook.com. And it sends a whole load of other data to many other companies and besides. And it could, well, let, I could let this go on for a while. But ultimately, you end up on their home screen, which is kind of amusing, because it's got this at the bottom of it, which is, don't worry, we'll never share anything without your permission. <laughs> So, so let's take a look at some of this in sli- slightly more detail. And this is a, this is pretty standard. This is a, a VK, the Russian social network, um, and their app is pretty typical of how the SDK is implemented. And I'm guessing probably in the default state, which is the app does an app initialize when the SDK is first loaded, saying SDK initialized, and then. When the app is in foreground, it's got activated app. And then when the app goes to background, it sends a message saying deactivated app. And when it comes back, and when you close the app, it says deactivated app. So you can actually start to profile like how long a user is using an app, how often they're opening the app, this kind of stuff. And uh, if you look at some of this data, if we are able to see it well, clearly, um, you've got a unique ID that is, well, we, we purport as personal data because it's uniquely attached to your browsing and whatever, your app usage. And then some other extraneous data on here that's also quite, in, quite telling. It's got, um, it's got stuff like what version of Android you're running, what the device you're running on, what your keyboard local, uh, localization is, you know, your time zone. You're getting quite a picture just from this one app of like, someone. And then it doesn't take much to go beyond that. So our second finding is some apps also routinely send Facebook data that is incredibly detailed and sometimes sensitive. This isn't a particularly new finding. There have been other people, so a good shout out to Exodus Privacy, who also t- reported about the Baby Plus app, and, uh, and Mobile Shizza, who also earlier this week, week I think, reported about um, the Pregnancy Plus app that sends granular data. So here's some examples we found in our data. So, so the top example here is Kayak. And Kayak sends your entire search to Facebook every time you do a search in their app, which is lovely. So, and it's interesting what they send because it's not just um, it's not just the content of your search. It's also some other stuff like your user score, whatever that is. And it's got obs- uh, obfuscated session IDs and all sorts of other things that they're sending to Facebook. Um, the other one that's on the bottom here is the King James Bible, uh, and it's quite typical of a lot of ways that app developers implement the SDK. And it allows them to track your usage through the app. So um, th- this one, when I originally tested it, they've actually made their data slightly less granular. But when I originally tested this app, um, it actually told you which verse and passage of the Bible you'd read, which is uh, what Facebook needs to know. <laughs> <laughs> So, and then the last bit is the, the actual advertising data that Facebook uses. And this is uh, a, a request to their ad network. And uh, some slightly interesting stuff that 
that comes from here is that you know, like the device is on charge, the, ma the battery percentage is full, there's free space. And this isn't, this isn't even uh, the most comprehensive example. I've seen other data on there, such as accelerometer positions. The other slight interesting thing, again, all linked with the, uh, the app ID. The other thing here is it's got uh, at the top there, copper false, which is the American's child protection, uh, child privacy act. And uh, it somehow decided that I'm not a child, even though it never asked me. So, <laughs> so and yeah, and it's, it's crucial to remember that this happens whether you're a Facebook user or you're not a Facebook, whether you're logged in or you're not logged in. So it's making profiles are being made regardless of whether you're have a Facebook account or you don't have a Facebook account, or you have to use some of these apps, and a profile is being built potentially. So why does this matter? Why does any of this matter? So our analysis obviously only focused on the data that apps transmit, and we can't possibly uh, say with defin definity how this data is being used. But here's what's really interesting, is that our first finding is that the vast majority of apps share data the second it's opened, and the data that is being transmitted um, indicates what kinds of app you use, when you use them, combined with a unique ad ID. And knowing what kinds of apps somebody uses and when can give quite a detailed uh, picture of someone's life. So these are four apps that we have actually tested. The first one is a Muslim prayer app. The second one is a period tracker. Indeed is a job search um, app. And My Talking Tom is a children's app. So what kind of person could that be? That looks like a person who is likely Muslim, likely female, likely looking for a job, and likely have, who likely has a child. So in our analysis, the apps that automatically transmit data, it all comes together with a Google Ad ID. That's a user-resettable, unique ID that also in our previous work on data brokers and ad tech companies is primarily used for uh, connecting different profiles together. Even though we don't know what is happening to this data, it would be pretty straightforward to link it up. There's also a second reason why this data is uniquely interesting, and that is knowing what kinds of app hundreds of millions of people use and when they use them gives, qu gives quite a unique insight into the Android app market. So if combined, event data such as app installed, SDK initialized, and deactivate app from different apps uh, offer a very detailed insight into the usage behavior of hundreds of millions uh, of people on apps. And again, we have deliberately focused on apps that have a lot of installs, at least 10 million, and some have even 500 million installs. So combined, we're looking at over 2 billion installs. And the kinds of data that these apps share, that really matters, because it's a lot of data. The question, though, is why do so many apps share data with Facebook the second that the app opens? There are obviously many reasons, and some of these are even good reasons, why, app use th why apps use third-party tracking and SDKs such as the Facebook SDK. Um, so what the Facebook SDK for Android does, it allows app developers to integrate their apps with Facebook's platform, and it contains a number of main components, such as analytics, ads, or login. So this is the reason why apps or some apps choose to use the SDK. Now here's where it gets a bit complicated. Facebook places this sole responsibility on apps to ensure that the data that they collect and ultimately transmit to Facebook has been obtained legally. And we've reached out to Facebook, and they confirmed to us again that um, it places a legal and cont contractual obligation on the developer, who they see as the data controller, to get consent, as it is required, for the use from users before sharing data with Facebook via the SDK. However, the kind of data sharing that we've observed in the majority of apps is the default implementation of the SDK. That's nothing we discovered that's clearly uh, admitted by Facebook in the Quick Start Guide for Android. So when you use the SDK, its default implementation automatically transmits data. Since May, and what happened in May, GDPR entered into force, um, lots of developers have been filing bug reports about the SDK. Um, on the right, you see one of them, but there are many. You can search uh, Facebook's developers' platform for them. 
This one from July 24th, somebody complains that they wanted to integrate the login, uh, but the moment the app opens, it transmits people's ad ID, and they're not allowed to do this. So the reason why developers complained is that when apps share data the second they're opened, you're unable to ask people for their explicit, unambiguous permission, which is the bar for consent that GDPR requires. So Facebook released the feature, uh, and that feature delays what they call the automatic event logging, but that feature was only released in June. And we, in our conversation with Facebook prior to this publication, Facebook confirmed to us in writing that prior to the introduction of this delay option, developers were able to disable the transmission of data, but that doesn't include something they call a signal that the SDK has been initialized. And this is exactly what we've observed in our research. And just as a reminder, the signal that the SDK has been initialized, that's data that, that, that gives a strong indication somebody's what kind of app somebody uses and when they're using this combined with their Google Ad ID. The big question is, of course, is this even legal? And we have a very long section in our report that explains this in a lot of detail, because it is very complicated. But what this analysis shares is that we think that the responsibility is a lot more complicated than saying this is entirely the responsibility of apps. Um, so since we've done this analysis in the UK, and the UK is still a member of the European Union and has implemented the GDPR, that's one legal framework that applies. We also looked at the e-privacy, and we also looked at competition law. And the underlying theme is who has what, what kind of responsibility. So the question is... What should Android developers do? What should Android developers do? Well, up your privacy game. Again, we looked at large apps that have lots of significant resources. At the very least, apps should comply with relevant privacy laws. And I'm saying this so clearly because we've seen apps that have like two paragraphs of privacy policies, and that is unambiguously non-compliant. Um, but we also sort of like you have a responsibility like to not transmit data that doesn't need to be transmitted, so data minimization, and giving people an actual choice. And it was quite interesting. We reached out to all of the 21 apps that automatically transmit data, as well as those that share much more detailed uh, data. And it was very fascinating to see the very different responses that we got from companies. Some, we had the impression, didn't fully understand the SDK and what the SDK does when. Some had a very different interpretation of what they should do legally. Um, some were, didn't really didn't realize that this is happening and promised us to update their apps. Um, we need to give some credit to Skyscanner. This is the only app that got back to us within three days and said, thanks very much. We've already immediately updated our app, and this is no longer happening. We haven't been able to test it. Um, And there's also been an app, the Weather Channel, they updated their app immediately after we tested it in December. But basically, the, the responses were quite very varied, and the general impression is that apps that have a gigantic user base need to do a better job. At the same time, however, I think our research also gives some thoughts to rethink third-party tracking on apps. Even if our legal analysis says it's a little bit more complicated, um, the, Facebook says the responsibility is with apps. So integrating, if you, the moment you integrate a third-party tracker, this comes with risks. And so the question is, do you really need to integrate the SDK? And if you integrate it, can you do it selectively? You shouldn't assume that the default implementation is compliant. And um, whenever you implement it, be very fair and transparent to bots users about exactly what it is you're doing and how you're collecting data. So what should Facebook and Google do? So privacy by design and by default is not just a principle for data protection, but it's also something that's quite relevant here. Um, we don't really, Facebook got back to us explaining the many different ways that developers are able to delay the kind of logging and or, or, like, or change the way that the SDK works, but the, to the best of our knowledge, there's no good reason uh, why the default shares data automatically. So if you're selling a product that allows people to send data to you and you make place the reliability on the people who do this data sharing, why shouldn't this be privacy-friendly by design and by default? 
there's also something interesting that happened in both the responses that we got from Facebook and also Google's initial reaction to the research that was published by, by the Oxford researchers earlier this year. And that was sort of like, but other companies also track people. Um, and Facebook spent a lot of time in parliamentary hearings this year and we had the pleasure to watch all of them. And um, in one of these hearings, uh, Facebook followed up in writing on the US Senate hearing and in one of these written responses, they said it was also, the topic was also shadow profiling, the tracking of non-users across the internet. And the company said that's a standard feature of the internet. Um, and Google also pointed like Amazon does this, Twitter does this, etc. So in a way, we need to reclaim the internet. Like there's no natural law that says that every website, every app you use sends such detailed data to hundreds of different companies every time you use them. So well, what can you do? So what can we do? So what, what our response from Google said, there's, there's two easy ways to fix this problem. You, just, you can opt out of ad personalization, and you can reset your ad ID. So we gave that a shot, see how that works out. So this is what happens when you opt out of ad personalization. So the top is with ad personalization on, and this is opted out. It's a big improvement there. The, uh, the, actual, the, real, the real improvement is that the flag has been changed from true to false, but the data is increased, and it's still being sent. So yeah, it's... Um, so you can't really opt out then. So your best bet, well, an audience like this has probably got one advantage. You've probably got, if you've got an Android phone, it's probably rooted. So you could always just block graph.facebook.com. I don't know what the, Im what the implications of that might be. There might be other stuff that just stops working. But, but most users don't have rooted phones. And so you, you, the only other real alternative is you could try and not install apps that use the Facebook SDK, but good luck working out which ones those are, because it's not well indicated on any app I've ever seen. So the only other options you have is to minimize what you're, the data you're, uh, you're sending. So you could segregate your apps, have a, a different profile in your Android device for every app, so that the, the, the advertising IDs are separate, and then you, you know, your, your ID will only apply to that one app. And obviously, you can always reset your ID and opt out. It doesn't really solve much, but it does at least, you know, it keeps your profile fresh. Keeps the, you know, it's the time frame that also makes quite a big difference to how you are profiled. So, but why should you have to do all of this? <laughs> so, I'm going to release all of my uh, environment, um, so anyone can re re replicate what we've done. I'm going to do that tomorrow because I need to get home and sleep, but. <laughs> Um, and so, yeah, I mean, my environment's going to go on PI's website. Um, and then all of our documentation is also available on PI's website. So if anyone else wants to look through what all of the apps we looked at do, I definitely suggest you have a look at Kayak. And I'd suggest you have a look at the LED flashlight. It's quite interesting, especially the consent flows. But um, yeah, and we're also on Tor. And that's Thank you. Thank you, Christopher. Thank you, Frederica, for the amazing talk. We are taking questions. Uh, just to remind you, there are five microphones, two in the front and three in the back. So queue up, and we're going to take a question right now from microphone two. Uh, what did you send to Facebook to get your data? Did you send the advertisement ID? Because it would be kind of nice to ask Facebook and then complain to the apps, and then ask Facebook again and repeat that every week. So I have actually done a DSAR to Facebook based on my advertising ID, and they responded outside of time. It wasn't until we actually sent them that we were going to release a report that they actually replied to my original DSAR, and they claimed they have no data, and we were going to follow up on this in the not too distant future. And they're releasing a new tool, it's like this clear history tool, because it's sort of like this experience just shows that it's excruciatingly difficult to actually exercise your data rights if you don't have an account. So there's a process, there's a form you can fill out, but it's sort of like it should be way easier to get access to the data that, that companies hold on you if you don't have an account. Thank you. Thank you. We are going to take a question from the internet real quick. Yes. 
the internet wants to know, did some of the apps prevent interception of data by pinning Facebook's SDK certificates? None of them did. <laughs> of the ones I tested at least, none of them. They were quite happy to send data to a man in the middle. Thank you. Uh, microphone one. Hi, thanks for the talk. Are there any open source projects that allow access to these kind of SDKs with privacy sensitive uh, defaults? Uh, not that I'm aware of, I don't think. Not that, sorry, not that I'm aware of. Would this even be permitted by the SDK terms of service? Sorry, say again? Would this kind of application or uh, li uh, libraries be permitted by Facebook or Google's uh, terms of API usage or SDK usage? We, we've read them, but I, I couldn't answer that on top of my head. Sorry. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Microphone one again. Uh, yeah, thank you for the talk. It was very interesting. And uh, I think from the top of my head that most of the apps you researched were free to download. Uh, now we usually uh, tell the layperson, uh, buy your app so you won't be the product. Do you have any indication of whether this is actually true? This is an excellent question, and the reason, so uh, when you confront companies about third-party tracking in general, the, the, the response that you usually get is, but apps need to monetize, or publishers need to monetize, and that's why we need that much tracking. However, the truth is that this has been the argument for a very long time, and at the same time, the tracking has become exponentially more invasive. And we're, the argument is still that, that this is all needed in order to show relevant ads. And we sort of say, uh, there are ways to use analytic software, there are ways to even show ads that are fair and transparent to people. But sort of like, but there's such a gap between what's, what's considered sort of industry practice or what's happening on a massive scale and what would be considered transparent and fair. So there's like a massive room for improvement. And that's why I'm not buying the argument that, that apps or companies like Facebook and Google say, but people need to sell ads. But, uh, you know, if, uh, is the microphone on? Oh, yeah. Uh, but do you know if uh, paid for apps also participate in this tracking? We haven't. I, I didn't do any analysis on any paid for apps. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, microphone five. But since it's the default of the SDK, it would be, it would be really interesting if somebody does that test. Five. Thank you. Thank you for your research. Um, you focus very much on Facebook. Do you know whether or not the uh, other com uh, companies, such as the Big Five, use um, um, uh, an SDK that's similar to this one? Um, yeah, I didn't really do much digging on the other ones, but just by looking at the logs as they were coming in, you see an awful lot of other tools that developers regularly use. So there's a tool, I think it's called Am Amplitude, and then there's, a, there's Crash Analytics from Google, I believe. And they all, I believe they must all come in an SDK because of the way that they send consistent data. But I haven't tested them for what data they're sending. Thank you. Mike, four. So my question is twofold. The first part will be, um, as you've said and have we seen that there is quite clearly a legal, like, they break the law by not answering a question stuff. Um, out of experience, we know that Facebook's legal team is quite strong, so would you say that there is um, a chance of, like, suing them? And the second part would be, uh, what do you say if we just automate the process to reset the ad ID? Could you say <laughs> the last part again? Like, is... Is there a way or is it like useful if we automate the process to reset the personal ad ID so, so that we can just reset the tracking every time? Yes, yeah, so to answer your first question, we're considering what we're going to do next. So I can say on that. And um, we read the legal section, like we, so read the legal section in our analysis. So we didn't want to summarize it here to, because we wanted to do it justice and it's a bit complicated. But I think, yes, there, it, it raises many questions. And there have been previous cases about the tracking of non-users by social plugging and by, by pixels. And so the question is sort of like, what's the, what's the parallel here? 
And to answer your second question about resetting your ad ID, I believe that was your question. Um, it's, it's, it's not very obvious, because to reset your ad ID on an Android device, you go into Settings, Google Ads, reset your Google Advertising ID, and that resets your Facebook ad ID as well, because it's the same ID. Yeah. And so one recommendation in the report is also sort of like, th this is the, the privacy settings of both Google and Facebook are still sort of counterintuitive. And there is no good reason, too, why the ad ID only resets when you reset it manually, because we know that many people will not understand or know what the ad ID is used for and what implications resetting it has. Thank you. And speaking of the report, I would just like to point out again that it's only being published now, so you are the first people to hear about it, and I think it deserves a round of applause. So the next question is from microphone two. Hi. Um, is there a way to delay loading the Facebook SDK so that uh, Facebook wouldn't even have the ability to execute code and then send the analytics data until you really needed to perform the function that you initially integrated it for? Yes, there's a, there's a couple of answers to this question. It's a good question. The, um, so Facebook say that any version of the SDK 4.34 or later has a delay function in it. The, Developers, even as late as December, are still saying that functionality is questionable as to whether it works. But the actual, AP, the actual graph API is, and it is just an API that you need a key for. And we think that some of the larger apps, which we tested, such as the WeChats and the Dropboxes, might actually implement their own calls to the API rather than going through the SDK, which is why they don't automatically make calls to graph. My Thank you. Um, microphone two for a follow-up question. So my point wasn't that uh, it was actually not implementing the code yourself, but using the Facebook code, but only loading it as soon as you actually need it. Is there a question? Oh, wait, uh, is that possible, was the I, question? I don't know, sorry. OK, thanks. Thank you. Microphone five. Hi, thank you. Um, seeing the amount of data that's transmitted, um, is changing the ad ID even making any sense? Yes, in the sense that it sends a signal that, I mean, it doesn't change anything. And we say that very clearly in the report. You have a new profile. It's not your old one. It's a new one. And we know how easy it is, at least technically, to relink data, etc. But I still think it sends a signal. That, that sort of you do want to minimize the granularity of the targeting that's happening. And at the same time, you do get a fresh profile. Um, we had a little bit of a curiosity in that in our analysis, the ID did not reset when the phone was put reset on factory reset. Uh, and Google got back to us. They said they tested it for several different Android devices, and they they had, a different, they had different findings. So we couldn't verify Google's tests. It might be that this is unique to the environment in which we tested the apps. Thank you. Thank you. Microphone three. Yeah. Um, hello. Uh, do you have any information how it is on Apple devices? That's a great mm -hmm. question. That might be my project for next year. <laughs> So some of the, uh, the bug reports that developers filed were also about the uh, Apple ad ID. But we haven't, we haven't done the, the research. But I'd be really interested to read it. Thank you. Uh, microphone three again. So you showed that when you opt out of ad personalization, the amount of transferred data actually increases. Um, do you know what kind of additional data that is? <laughs> I can back on slides. I think that's like for this very specific app, right? Yeah, this, and this is uh, yeah, this is from Skyscanner, and this is their custom app data for our origin selection. So when you go through their process, or when you when this was tested, at least when you went through their process and you selected what city you wanted to fly from, it would send data. I um, I don't know why it sends more when the uh, when advertising uh, per, when personalization is opted out. I don't know. Oh, so Sorry. that's. But just contractually, when you opted out, you're not allowed, Google got back to us to say, when you've opted out of app personalization, you're not allowed to use this 
data for ad personalization. First of all, that's like a restriction on, the, on use, it's not a restriction on connection, but also it's only a restriction on use for advertisement. We still think you could be using it for different purposes. E.g. surveying or whatever. Or other things. Thank you. Mike five, please. Uh, hi. So I have a question. Would it make sense, uh, for example, that uh, when we uh, do this kind of research and we say that uh, these applications are really uh, violating the privacy, to to actually extend the so we have the F Droid and this alternative uh, application stores to add additional indications saying, look, this is a, this application is very much has a very low privacy rating, and then if somebody wants to download it. He just can decide. Like there can be like five stars the the user review and like one star for the privacy review, and just make sure that it's super obvious if you're downloading a, a privacy intrusive app not to download it or just just to be aware that what's happening. That's an excellent point, and be, that would be a great feature to be implemented. Um, and one of our recommendations for Google was that they implement something similar. To show, you know, to users on their Play Store, they already show certain other characteristics about the app, like whether it has in-app purchases and other things. Exactly. Why don't they show that it's got a tracker attached to it, or it's using the SD, a Facebook implement uh, integration, or any of these other things? But to, to add two things, one is sort of like uh, the, the Play Stores, they have terms of, terms of services and, 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 and they all say you have to comply with existing laws. So what we observe here is also sort of like there's a discrepancy, obviously, uh, between the terms and how apps behave in practice. And the other thing I want to stress is that for this research, we only looked at Facebook and Facebook is... Uh, a, a tracker that's present in many apps, but there are thousands of, tra of, of different tracking companies and sort of like to assess how invasive uh, an app is, it's really interesting to see how many different trackers they have. And the research that we referred to at the beginning um, by Ruben Bins and others at the University of Oxford, they really looked at the number of trackers that different apps have. Um, and it's, sometimes it's quite a bit. I mean, I was thinking... Thank you. There is a person at mic four who's been waiting since forever. Hi. Um, I was particularly interested in your communication with the app, uh, the apps you were, like, you contacted the app developers. Uh, is there an option to make these conversations public? I feel like it would be really interesting and it would give me somewhat of an angle to attack this problem from the customer point of view. So we contacted the app on December 19, and we appreciate that this is an unusually busy time of the year. Um, and we have added all responses. We, we obviously can't publish the conversation, but we published the responses that the apps shared with us. And you can find them for each of the app. You can see the response at the end. Uh, and sort of like the, it, many apps didn't get back to us, but if they get back to us, we would obviously consider to add their statements at a later point. This is this is really brilliant. Thank, Thank you. you very much. We have time for a couple more questions, but and please. also to be fair, some said they need more time to evaluate that internally. So just to be fair, um, I wouldn't interpret a lack of response as anything negative just yet. Thanks. I would like to say thank you to everyone who's asking questions today because you are making talks even more amazing than they are. <laughs> so a round of applause to everyone who has asked speakers at least one question. <laughs> Please do that more often. Microphone one. Um, hi. I. Uh, hello. Um, hi. Um, uh, I have another question related to communication, sort of. Um, I'm a bit surprised of the, all, the amount of data that Facebook is taking. Um, have you ever tried to modify the JSON a little bit and, I don't know, upload like one gigabyte of them and see if Facebook drinks it all? <laughs> I think that would give our, uh, our general counsel a heart attack. <laughs> <laughs> It's interesting though, actually, it actually raises a very interesting side point, is that some of the apps when I tested them, they have, they're communicating with so many trackers 
that it actually, like, a few of them actually crashed my environment because it's just using up way too much memory trying to log all of the trackers it's trying to connect to. Um, and it, yeah, when I changed to ad personalization off, or to opting out of ad personalization, it actually starts to, uh, well, from my experience, it's a documented bug in, on a MITM proxy that's in their uh, GitHub. There's a bug where um, the Android device starts initiating HTTP2 connections without any preamble, and MITM proxy can't handle it, and it just keeps dropping all these connections, and eventually just floods your log with rubbish. <laughs> Thank you. I feel like next year we might have a talk from someone who actually decides to try it out. Microphone two, please. Yeah, along the same uh, ideas is uh, since you already fetched these requests um, and they are bound to the app ID, uh, to the ad ID, is it possible to maybe if uh, Freifunk would collect like the last 1,000 uh, add IDs and just randomly mingle them to different profiles, so to poison <laughs> them all. Uh, I mean, I'm not suggesting to do that, but uh, <laughs> would it be possible? I said it raises a lot of GDPR questions. Yeah. You might not want to do that, mm -hmm. I guess. <laughs> Don't try this at home. Mm. Yeah. Microphone three, please. We have an overwhelming number of questions, but we only have time for one more. Then thank you very much that I can be the last one. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, one question: um, Have you any experience in how successful is uh, how successful Facebook is to link your ad ID with your account, or what happens when you delete your account? And um, I'm pretty sure Facebook still keeps some record of you, and if they can, if they use any measurements to find you again even if you don't have your account anymore? So Facebook, in their privacy policy, in the cookie policy, and in the, in the business terms for Facebook, pro business terms, I don't know the exact word on top of my head, but they ex explain how they use data. And there are sections that explain how the company uses data for people who don't have an account. Um, and also in our conversation with the company, that got back to us to say, this is how we use it. Um, we find that it's still not super clear um, and, and sort of like for this specific behavior that we're observing. Um, that's a very vague answer, but it's sort of like, it's like we, don't, we don't know what they're doing. So we have to, because we don't know, you could, you can, we have to sort of like trust statements that are made in the policies and that the company made elsewhere. But what's interesting, the responses to Congress where shadow profiling was a big issue, is the response sort of like various purposes are given and the data is stored for varying length of time. And so that's why it's very, sometimes a bit tricky to figure out exactly what's happening with this. And we'd appreciate if that's a bit more transparent. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Frederike Kaltoiner, Christopher Weatherhead from Privacy International with an amazing talk. Thank you.